Gary DePaul with Unlabeled Leadership. Welcome to episode 84, George Gu on finding potential and adapting. Here's a shout out to listeners in Tennessee, specifically in Franklin, Hermitage, and Nashville, and in North Carolina in Cornelius, Kannapolis, Durham, Fayetteville, and Goldsboro. With that, let's get started. George Gu is passionate about helping organizations improve their performance. His company, Improvement Consulting Group, has completed more than 300 consulting projects and trained more than 60,000 professionals within 30 industries. He resides in Shanghai City, China, and travels throughout the country facilitating workshops about performance improvement and talent development. He's dedicated to stewarding the next generation of talent development professionals and he's agreed to be the next president of the International Society for Performance Improvement, commonly known as ISPI. If you're ever in Shanghai, you'll want to meet George. Part 1. America, the Beautiful Country In my book, Nine Practices of 21st Century Leadership, I describe a practice called Communicating Like Broadcasters. This practice is about giving back to your organization, your profession, and community through stewardship. And by doing this practice, you continue to learn through teaching others. That practice captures what George is currently doing in his career. To get to this point in his career, George has had to do a lot of learning, and he benefited from a lot of stewards as well. In this story, George explains how he started in human resource management and a critical conversation that got him started. Here's George to explain. This story dates back. It goes back as far as 1993. That was almost 28 years ago. Wow. I graduated uh, in 1991 from Nankai University, one of the very good prestigious universities in China. I graduated from English department. My academic advisor, Dr. Dennis Fields from St. Cloud State University of Minnesota, he was doing, uh, he was paying an academic visit to Nankai University. He's an HRD professor. He came to Nankai University. I was introduced to meet him. I was introduced by my first, Mrs. Larson. She was my first English teacher. Her name's Dora Larson. She's from the Chesapeake Bay area. And uh, she taught me English in ni- back in 1987. So five years later, she and her husband came back to Nankai University to teach again because they had a wonderful experience teaching English in, uh, at Nankai University. So they returned and they got to know Dennis and say, they introduced me to Dr. Dennis Fields. So actually, I, I went to see Dennis. When I got to his room, he stayed at the guest house of Nankai University. We prepared for the professors and, you know, uh, from other countries and experts and faculties. So he stayed there and I went to see him. He was wearing, uh, you know, big shorts and it was a summer, hot summer, high summer. Ah. He greeted me and then he... I sit there and then we met about one half hours and he asked me, what did you do? who I am, where I come from, where my family was, and all that, got to know each other a little bit. And then he asked me, would you like to study human resources development? I said, what is that? <laughs> so you, no idea. I have no idea. I had an idea. I had an idea what human resources was, because uh, at that time I was working for SOE, a state-owned enterprise in local, uh, in Tianjin. Tianjin is one of the big cities in China. It's next to Beijing. It's, uh, it's like a province, but it's municipality. Okay. It's a city, but it's, you know, under central government. There's, there's Tianjin, Beijing, Shanghai, and Chongqing. There are four municipalities in China. At that time, like maybe eight, nine million people. And right now it's maybe 19 million people. It's a big city. He asked me, would you like to study HRD? And uh, I said, what is HRD? I only know human resources because I was watching, I was working for one of the biggest uh, uh, state-owned enterprises, SOEs in Tianjin. I also part-time help our personnel department to do a lot of hiring, English tests and all of that. I heard the term human resources from a Spanish professor because we have seminars and I translate for those seminars. 
this uh, professor became uh, Siebes, uh, the Sino-European International Business School professor here in Shanghai, not far from here. And I asked him, is that different from personnel? He said, well, basically, they are the same thing, but quite different, <laughs> quite different. I was very humble because he's a foreign professor. He is up there very high. I'm just a young kid of 25 years old. And I know that I, my destiny, I need to go out there to either Canada or, 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 or the United States to study because I'm my, a lot of my foreign teachers, they are from the United States and Canada and the UK. I know my English skills is, is up there, but I need to, to be there because I, I want to study something. Because what I study is was English, British, and American literature. Okay. So, but my work is not in literature, <laughs> you know. And English is just, just, just language, is just a tool. So it's just a tool. And what do I do with a tool? So I did uh, importing and exporting business, and I, I translating for municipal for the big bucks in in the in the city, and you know, for the for the, for for my uh, group chairman, and sometimes for the government if they're short of hands, I, I I'm borrowed to translate for the vice mayors. And then he said, human resources is a way to develop talents. It's a systematic of way to develop talents for organizations. And would you like to study that? And it is a, it's a study uh, in America. I said, wow, really? If I study that, will I become the personnel chief in our group in the future? He said, maybe, <laughs> maybe. I said, no, I don't want to do that. Maybe, maybe I don't want to become, I want to become a business leader uh, may, maybe in the future. And he said, every way leads to Rome. It all depends on you. He said, I cannot guarantee you anything, but I can help you to get into the program because it's my program. Our department chair, he really looks in also our international studies director. He, they all really look into China to see, I mean, internationally, not only China, Malaysia, Singapore, <laughs> Philippines, they see a lot of UAE, they see a lot of international perspective. They said, we are recruiting a lot of international students. You might want to consider it. So I went back home and discussed, and would you like me to do? I discussed with my parents. They said, well, you, you make your own decision. My parents, they don't want me to go far away because it's a tradition. You know, when you grow up, you stay around, take care of uh, for the rest of their lives. And so that's our Chinese tradition. And I said, you know, I want to go because I'm not married and oh, I have in Chinese, America, the word Meiguo means beautiful country. Do you know that? Oh, no, I did not know that. Yeah. Um, the United States of America is called the beautiful country. Two words, Mei means beautiful. Oh, you look beautiful. Like, Mei. you know, you're very beautiful, meaning you Mei. Mei means M-E-I, spelled as M-E-I. Mei means beautiful. So Meiguo, America is a beautiful country. I said, I want to go. And I have a lot of friends that they, they're there already. So before he left, I, I, I met him again. And I said, uh, Dr. Fields, I really like to come to the United States and study. He said, okay, good. <laughs> okay, good. Good for you. Now you need to, to do a lot of things. I, I need your GRE score. I need your this. I need your that. So I, I studied the GREs, I, I took a TOEFL test, went through the whole nine yards and applied visas. And of course, our international studies director helped me a lot. And also a year later, our department chair, John Burning, Dr. John Burning and his wife, and also they all came to Beijing again, to Beijing, to Tianjin area again. So I met them again and uh, I accompanied them to tour Beijing and Tianjin area for a couple of days. They really liked me. I try to be the best kid in the world on the planet, you know? Yeah, yeah. I show them around. They really liked me. They said, gosh, we must get you into the program. I got into the program and uh, a year later, I got a full assistantship, got all the benefits of tu on tuition and all that, because Minnesota has a great state grant to recruit uh, international students. The, the university got that grant. I was blessed. And I, later on, I learned that there are other Malaysian and com, uh, students in other countries. They also got that same grant. They're benefited from that as well. It was that 
moment, uh, the day, the very first meet between Dr. Dennis and I, I mean, when I first met Dennis, he kind of just opened the door for me. He encouraged me to explore the HRD area, the unknown area, because I didn't know what, what, what it was. And our conversation, I still remember vividly, he was wearing a, a big sandals and the way he looks and exactly, you know, the same as years later, I pictured and uh, later on, he became my advisor for years. And for two years, he was my academic advisor. I graduated. He helped me a lot on the way that my graduation, my master's degree, and also on the direction that, that, that I'm going. Actually, actually he started, he's one of the founders of IBSTPI, the International Board of Standards for Training, Performance, and uh, Instruction. That board, he started in 1970s. In 2011, I also became a director of that board from 2011 to 2017 for six years, for two terms. I was sitting on that board because of him also. If you had not have met Dennis Fields, who knows where you could have ended up and what you may have been doing. And- wow, that would be, wow. You know, history, there's no what ifs in history. <laughs> Yeah. I could have been somebody else. I could have been maybe a person, a PR executive, like many of my uh, friends they did. Last year, and I, you know, I worked in Beijing. I moved to Beijing and worked uh, in there at a PR firm. is uh, is American firm called Edelman Public Relations. Edelman's double headquarters in both New York and Chicago. And I had a very good job, a very high pay. I called Silver Collar back in 1996. So for the whole year, full year I worked there, I could have been a very high ranking PR executive or chief, something like that in China, at a Chinese company. If I hadn't come to the US, like my friends, they they are like the Mercedes Benz, their Boeing, their Airbus, PR has, Walmart, PR has, so far, I mean, so on and so forth. So Because you met Dennis Fields and you ended up studying in HRD, you now help several organizations improve their performance and help improve the systems within those companies. He changed my life. He found me my major. My major is uh, was in training in performance improvement. And later on, after I came back to China, I, came, I uh, started to conduct research in management. Learning serves management. Learning is one of the many departments among a company. So how to run the company. Training's value is deeply embedded in the systematical management. So it changed my life, basically. If he hadn't opened that door for me, I, I, I wouldn't have been, been doing this, uh, any, any of this. I'm currently the president-elect for ISPI. My term would be 2023 to 2025. And I have the ATD in China more than 10 years. And I taught their one of their learning design courses, instructional design courses in China was designed by Ruth Clark. And uh, I taught that course for five or six years for ATD. Learning is just a vehicle. It's, it's just a means, but uh, it's, it's not the end, but a means to an end. And the end is business results. So. Dennis opened, he started me, I mean, started all of this for me and the the rest of his history. The rest is history. Yep. Part two, what happens when the manager believes in you? One of the themes that keeps coming up in this podcast is the principle, believe in others. It's a simple principle. But unfortunately, it's misunderstood and not really appreciated as much as, well, it should be appreciated. And that's probably why this keeps coming up over and over again in episodes. George illustrates this principle in this story. Here's George to explain what happened. My longest employment was at U.S. West. Later, I became Quest. It's a telephone company. Okay, yeah, yeah. Baby Bell. That was in 2001 to 2003. Uh, one of my directors, her name is uh, Leslie Sawyer. She is a very talented director. She knows what leadership is. Later on, I realized that she put into a lot of uh, thought into about empathy, about integrity, about listening, about influence and person. This is one of the one of the examples is that I was under very heavy, heavy stress. I was in charge of a big project, was MSN. 
At that time, Quest signed marketing alliance with MSN. Steve Ballmer and our then CEO and Joe Nacio they signed、uh, up agreement. So the two companies are promoting MSN together, and we are providing transport and MSN providing the content. MSN have a lot of a lot of stuff. We went to、uh, Redman to get training, all of that, and I was representative on the training team. Okay. So the Quest production team, the product team have from somebody from legal, from、uh, from process, from marketing, from procurement, from training, from HR. You know what I mean? There's a, like everyone, four, every everybody, sales, everybody. So I'm representing the training team to provide training services for this rollout. It's a grand rollout. My team of almost ten people. I'm the project lead. There are two strong designers. I'm the lead strong designer. Two strong designers. So e-learning team. There are you know they they have to work all together. We're providing EPSS. We're providing e-learning. We're providing providing learning learning、uh, on-site learning. You know face-to-face、uh, -face training. We're providing、uh, job aids. We're pro providing、uh, brown baggy sessions. All that material has to be produced by us. Gotcha. Bell system is a very complicated. I tell you this, it's very complicated because Quest or the former U.S. Bell came from Northwestern Bell, Mountain Bell, and North Pacific,、um, Northwest Pacific Bell. So basically, everybody from the west to the west of the Mississippi River is all those three bells.、So、they merge together, but the system is a three set of systems. So it's very, very complicated. Uh, at that time, so it's a big work, but that project was a success. But in the middle of it, I was under a lot of stress because I have this project as a lead and have other projects. You know,、uh. as a general designer or project manager, I I'm the project manager of this pro project manager and also the lead instructional designer on this one. I was under a lot of stress, and、uh, she talked to me. She heard what I'm saying and all of that, and. I, we have two phone calls, probably. You know, she's in Denver. I'm, I'm, I was based in Minneapolis. This is Leslie Sawyer. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, you're talking with her about it, right? She encouraged me. She、uh, all I remembered was the big smile I had, the, the strong confidence I had after I talked to her. So, so she empowered me. She know the power of delegate, and she know the power of encouragement, and empowered me to have this courage to keep going, to go on. The word, exact word she said, I still remember clearly. One of the sentences she said, "George, look at who you are. You are so talented," and she meant it. She said, "Your potential is so great." Almost the same thing what Doctor Burning said to me. But different versions, you know.、Mm. Basically, she encouraged me. She says I am very talented, has very strong learning capability, has very strong capability to adapt. And she also said you come from a different culture and you adapt to the American culture. Now you are leading one of the、uh, biggest projects on in this country. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I felt very important at that time. I said,、yes. "What? I really didn't realize that." I said, "Yes, it is because MSN providing all these、uh, services, and、uh, I'm the project lead. We're providing actually the services not only to our own territory of the 14 states, but also from East Coast to West Coast, the West Coast to East Coast. So everybody is covered." And you know what? The only time I worked overtime was for this project. Was all because of Leslie. I never told her that. I never told anybody.、Uh, midnight, our uh, uh, cafeteria—they、uh, have different shifts, you know, in the, in the Bell Company. <laughs> And they're different building. You know, it's, it's ages, ages of building. We were at the AT and T building. I never know that, but because I worked overnight and I slept on the floor. Oh wow! Yeah, I worked so hard. When someone believes in you, yes. When you feel valued, oh gosh, it changes your work output. Yeah, yeah. You want to do. You want to be successful. You want to contribute. When you feel valued as a professional, right? As a human being, it's a shame that too many organizations, especially in the U.S., where people don't feel valued,、mm -hmm. they are not encouraged. They become, as Liz Wiseman in her book Multiplier says, the Walking Dead. <laughs> They're just there. They don't feel valued. 
it's a blessing and a wonderful experience when someone like Leslie Sawyer sincerely expresses how much she values you and what you do. And look what happens. It's your first time you've ever did overtime and sleeping on the floor because you want to do a great job and you're passionate right. about what you do. I also encourage my team. I well, later on we we loved all this in the tears because uh, one of my uh, team member Kathy and she's still out there in Seattle and we're all working in you know, different cities. We're a team, yeah. And we work we work so hard. Everybody works so hard. And then <laughs> one of the jokes is that uh, Kathy said, you know, at the end of the project, you know, started the training started rolling. Uh, we opened the back doors because our LMS couldn't uh, meet all the demand. All the crisis are gone. All the dust started to settle. And I asked my partner, she's an instructor designer on this team. I said, what are you going to do over the weekend? Are you going to take some time off? And she said, Cassie said, George, I need to do some laundries. Otherwise, I'm going to wear my wedding, wedding gowns next week. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love it. True story. Oh, we we're, we have been best friends. We're on Facebook friends right now. I mean, we're all the old team. We we just love it. We're one of the best teams at that time to work together. Yeah, we have become uh, lifelong friends. Part three, inspiring courage. I mentioned the principle, believe in others, but there's a part of that principle that I really haven't talked much about, and that is helping other people believe in themselves and giving them the trust and the encouragement they need. Related to this concept, George shares some advice. Here's George to explain. Somebody told me is, uh, is uh, later on is a Standard Chartered Bank Chief Strategy Officer from London. I worked with him for a short period of time. He told me, George, and... He told me very serious, he's saying like this, George, courage, courage is all you need. If you have courage, you can do anything. At that time, I, I felt that he, he's right. And later on, I thought the power of that sentence. What I'm saying is we need to inject courage into everybody. Being a head of a department or head of a team, I think we need to encourage people, encourage people to believe in themselves. I believed in Leslie. I worked so hard because I couldn't let Leslie down. She trusted me so much. I couldn't let her down. I must work hard. I need to get this done. I, meet my, I must meet the deadline tomorrow morning, 8. What I do, I don't go home. I just work here overnight. That's the trust that she bestowed in me. I couldn't let, let her down. But it's a very step. Leslie has been my best boss ever. And later on, she also told me, George, I work for you. I still remember vividly what she said. She said, I work for you. I'm your director, but I work for you. If you don't have anything, uh, you just pick up a phone call and tell me what your weather is. I'll be fine. I'll be, I'll be great. I'm glad to hear that. But whenever you need support, need me to pave the way for you, need extra resources, I won't hear for you. So just go ahead and fly. I'm all here to back you up. I'm always here for you. It's a completely different mindset from the traditional corporate thinking where you serve the people that you report to all the way up to the chief executive officer. Right. But instead, they serve you. They make sure that you have what you need to be successful. They remove barriers. I love the idea of they give you courage. They encourage you to be the best that you can be, which is so important. Right. She's a, my best part of my career. Ever. And I had a second best boss in China after I came back, but that's the later story. <laughs> ah. she's, uh, she's very much like Leslie, very encouraging people, very shining, very positive, everything. Even we were in crisis, in bad times, biggest challenge, challenge of our lives. She's still very positive. That's why I liked her very much. And Leslie is the first one. She really trusted me. She really believed in me that I can do this, I can do that. Later on, I, I realized that, that uh, she has excellent leadership skills. I, I never realized that, but uh, later on. But I never told her she was the best boss I ever had. I never had a chance to. <laughs> My thanks to George Gu. If you'd like to learn more about George, go to the show notes. And if you have a comment or question, go to unlabelleadership.com, click the message icon, and you can leave a voicemail message for up to one minute. I like to thank those who contribute to the show. Your contributions make a difference because this is an all volunteer service. 
Mostly, I like to thank you for listening. Until next time, lead on.